And good evening, everyone. Uh, we'd like to thank you again for attending Making the Invisible Visible, a presentation and Q&A session about inadequate regulation and air pollution in Ohio, with a specific focus on Belmont County, home of the proposed PTTG ethane cracker plant site. Again, my name is Ben, and I'm an organizer with Concerned Ohio River Residents, a citizens advocacy group based in the Ohio River Valley. Tonight, uh, we've assembled a team of scientists, air monitoring experts, public health professionals, and community advocates to illustrate the extent of air pollution in our region and provide you with the equipment and information necessary to keep yourself, your loved ones, and your community safe. We aim to leave you with an understanding of how faulty permitting processes leave us, the residents of the Ohio River Valley, vulnerable to potentially dangerous levels of airborne pollutants. And we hope you'll see why we believe the fracking industry must be subjected to a comprehensive health impact study before our state regulatory agencies grant any more permits to petrochemical related extraction projects. This presentation was made possible with the help of the Freshwater Accountability Project, the American Geophysical Union's Thriving Earth Exchange, Carnegie Mellon University's CREATE Lab, the Southwestern Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, Frack Tracker Alliance, and Halt the Harm Network. We developed this presentation with the intention of making the invisible visible. And in this instance, we mean that quite literally. You can't see the airborne pollutants emitted by compressor stations like this one in Powhatan Point, Ohio. But we want to make it clear that what you don't see can still hurt you. Let's take a look at the emissions coming from this, this compressor station in Powhatan Point. To oil and gas executives, the pollution emitted by facilities like this one and the toll it can take on local residents' health is little more than an externalized cost. To us, this pollution means something much greater. We know the residents of the Ohio River Valley as our neighbors, our friends, our family members, our loved ones. Maybe you know someone whose health has suffered as a result of fracking-related air pollution. Maybe you've experienced symptoms yourself. We want you to know that you're not alone and that we're working on your behalf to hold accountable the regulatory agencies that allow this kind of pollution to happen in the first place. This presentation is about airborne contaminants like volatile organic compounds and particulate matter. It's about permitting and it's about regulation, but most importantly, it's about you. Again, we'd like to thank you for attending tonight. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Leah Harper, Managing Director of the Freshwater Accountability Project. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. <laughs> one, one quick note before we begin with our presentation. Um, in the interest of time, we decided to insert supplementary information about certain slides in the form of QR codes, the small black and white squares or circle codes pictured on the left of your screen. You can use these QR codes to access links, documents, and other resources during and after our webinar, and they're really simple to use. All you have to do is pull out your smartphone, uh, open your camera app, point your camera at the QR code on your device's screen as if you're going to take a picture. And without pushing any buttons, a prompt should appear that looks like this one, labeled number three. Um, click on the link and it should open the resource in your browser. Um, if you're listening in on the phone this evening, if you don't have a smartphone handy, or if you experience any technical difficulties, that's okay, because we'll be providing this presentation uh, to the email address you use to sign up. Uh, and again, I'd like to introduce Leah Harper of the Freshwater Accountability Project to talk about where regulation falls short. Good evening, Leah. Hi. Hi, Ben. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we've been working on this project for quite a while, and we're so very glad to share with you. Fracking has caused pollution in any region it is in, and the more heavily fracked a region, the more problems arise, not only for the environment, but for public health as a result. Residents in Southeast Ohio have already experienced diesel emissions from heavy truck traffic, especially with all the brine trucks carrying massive amounts of frac waste and with the infrastructure popping up all around them like pipelines, associated pigging and compressor stations, fractionation facilities, dehydrators and other industrial plants, all of which emit pollutants and require air permitting from the Ohio EPA. But these are permitted individually. They are not permitted as cumulative polluters in a small region like Belmont County. There is no doubt that in Ohio, there is a lack 
of monitoring for actual air pollution, especially during big episodic releases like compressor station blowdowns, the stimulation of frac wells to produce the gas, along with the flow back water and during other releases such as flaring at a frac well. This all stems back to the dismantling of important regulations, including the Halliburton loophole at the federal level and state level laws like the Niehaus law, which took away local control over the industry in Ohio, allowing a heavy industrial polluter to be located close to homes and schools and in what is otherwise zoned as residential. To this day, Ohio does not have regulations in place to adequately monitor and regulate what is called Chief's Orders Facilities, such as Austin Masters and the associated 4K facility that handles radioactive frac waste next to the Ohio River and Belmont County Martins Ferry. Unfortunately, frac waste injection well emissions in Ohio are deemed too trivial to cause a need for air permitting, which we question, especially when we see FLIR video footage like this at the Cellcor injection well in Cambridge, Ohio. One of the reasons that the ODNR has been able to escape by more stringent regulations is because frac waste is falsely labeled as non-hazardous, even though in fact it is very hazardous. It is interesting that benzene from any other industry must be labeled as hazardous for disposal, but benzene from the fracking industry is magically labeled as non-hazardous to be disposed of by facilities that are also labeled as non-hazardous, making disposal of this toxic waste much more economical for the industry than it should be. By the way, 4K now wants to build a barge dock so they can bring in toxic frac waste to be more cheaply transported to Ohio. Another barge offloading facility is proposed in Marietta, Ohio for an injection well, such as this one like in Socor, it's very huge. We are just now getting a look at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources draft regulations for these chief's orders facilities. But now that the industry has cheaply handled its waste without adequate regulation in Ohio for many years, it's a little late. We did try to force this point through a lawsuit years ago, which was dismissed due to standing, which also shows that sometimes we don't have the justice system as uh, an alternative to be able to get the protections that we need. A recent report by Earthworks outlined in detail how deficient Ohio is in its regulations and responsiveness to citizen concerns. This report documented case after case of citizen concerns that were inadequately handled, even ignored by regulators and our rec elected representatives. This is why we appreciate the American Geophysical Union's thriving Earth Exchange to be able to receive the scientific methodology and validation that we need to make our concerns heard as they are happening on a community level for those who are living next to these industrial polluters and are experiencing toxic trespass of harmful pollutants from this highly unregulated industry. Numerous studies have been done that show the oil and gas industry is releasing its pollutants without adequate measurements and monitoring, including a report by the Environmental Integrity Project that stated, the oil and gas extraction industry's booming growth over the last decade because of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling has increased the variety and volume of toxic chemicals used by industry and released into the air, water, and ground. Way back in 2012, the EPA estimated that oil and gas extraction industry emits at least 127,000 tons of hazardous air pollutants every year, all of which are toxic release inventory listed chemicals. These include benzene, a carcinogen, xylenes, which are cause, can cause breathing problems, headaches and fatigue, and formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen and damages the respiratory system. Despite these known emissions of toxic substances, the oil and gas industry is still not required to report to the toxic release inventory like every other industry in the United States. There we go. A major concern with the planned petrochemical build out in the Ohio River Valley is that just one cracker plant like the Royal Dutch Shell plant being built now in Beaver County 
or the PTT Global Plan for Belmont County will require an estimated 1,000 additional frac wells to be drilled and produced per year. So it is not just the air pollution from the petrochemical facilities themselves, which is massive, but from the frac waste wells needed for ethane. No one's tracking these cumulative allowed permitting for air pollution in a region like the Ohio River Valley, known for air inversions, which can concentrate pollutants and keep them there. With Belmont County already being the most heavily fracked county in Ohio, and with all the infrastructure and waste handling facilities like Austin Masters and 4K, and with the many injection wells that take frac waste that are not regulated for air emissions, we can see that the cumulative toxic air emissions could be a big problem even before a huge ethane cracker plant is built to produce one and a half million tons of polyethylene for plastic we don't need. So we're going to have to organize our communities ourselves, as pointed out in this report from the National Resource Defense Council. PTTG's 298 page air permit shows the plant will be allowed to emit these pollutants and more for startup. Thank goodness we were able to successfully mount an appeal to the Environmental Review Appeals Commission or we would have been left with the original permit granted by the Ohio EPA, which had many deficiencies, we believe, but we were able to correct through that appeal. It seems like every week there is a new study that comes out to warn about the air pollution emitted by fracking and its toxic radioactive waste. Just recently, a study was released about radioactive particulate matter, which has been a concern that we've asked about for years. The report, even printed in Popular Mechanics and other media, stated that the likely mechanisms include the fugitive release of natural gas, which contains a higher than background level of radon at wellheads, compressor stations, pipelines, and other associated facilities, the management, storage, discharge, and disposal of flow back and produced water, which is rich in radioactive materials, the accidental spill or beneficial use of produced water in nearby communities, the handling, transport, management, and disposal of radioactive drill cuttings. Researchers suggest that people should not live within 12 miles downwind of fracking operations and the industry should do a better job of closing off leaks. Unfortunately, now that science shows our concerns are valid, there is still no additional monitoring or regulation for harmful radioactive particulate matter or other toxins released into the air and water. Since this webinar is just about air, we're, I'm not gonna start talking about water, <laughs> uh, but that's also a big problem. Another big example of how industry harms are hidden until the research comes out is the frac well blowout at Powhatan Point, which spewed methane gas into the atmosphere for 20 days. The regulatory authority in Ohio, the ODNR, said the amount of emissions were unknown. We had no idea of the magnitude of the release until years later when the satellite data showed that the release was about 60,000 tons. We heard about Aliso Canyon every day, but we never heard about Paul Hatton Point, which was bigger. Can you imagine how much methane that was as a light gas to equal that many tons? This makes me wonder how much radioactive particulate matter may have been released as well. How are people living next to such releases to know if there are harms to be able to hold the industry accountable? We are not there yet. But through a community science, we hope to get there. This is why this air monitoring program we have begun is so important and we thank our funders and the Thriving Earth Exchange and all our colleagues for assisting us and our need to know to be able to protect ourselves. What can we do in the meantime? More on that later, but when I talk to the US EPA, because I, I appeal to them as well and about our many concerns, what they did is send me this form and told me to document. So if that's what we get from the US EPA, we will do that too. That is the start. And thanks to our funders again and the scientific help we are given on this project, we are able to provide crowdsourced data to demonstrate our concerns are valid and justify our need for better monitoring and regulations of fracking and its related operations, especially a huge cracker plant such as the one proposed for Dilly's Bottom by PTT Global. Some people still assert that there's nothing that we can be that we can do about this industry, but there's always something we can do and we can start with documenting and community science. Thanks so much, Leah.
Next, we'd like to introduce Garima, our American Geophysical Union Thriving Earth Exchange Community Science Fellow and a current PhD student at Columbia University. Garima will be discussing this project's efforts to understand cumulative emissions. Hi folks, nice to see everyone here today. Thanks for coming. Um, so as we're trying to understand the air in Belmont County, we first have to start by understanding the emissions that are coming from each individual site and then adding them up together to understand the cumulative impacts of all the sites together. And so this maybe sounds easy, but this information is definitely not provided easily. Um, so to get this information, uh, we went to the Ohio EPA's website and we searched for all of the permits um, that were given, the revisions and the issuances granted by the agency. And then we downloaded each site's permit, some of which were 20 to 80 pages long. And then what you were looking for in that was one line for each pollutant um, that clearly stated how much of that pollutant could be emitted in a year. And we did this just for the first half of 2019. And you can see that cumulatively, um, just in these six months, the Ohio EPA permitted more than 343 tons of carbon monoxide, 1,400 tons of volatile organic compounds to be emitted each year. Um, and these are emissions uh, permits that are allowed for the rest of the time that these facilities are allowed to operate. Um, so to explain a little bit about what these compounds are, carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas. It's what is monitored by your smoke alarms. Um, high exposure of this gas can kill you, and sometimes people who are sleeping can die before they even have symptoms. Um, nitrogen oxide, it's a, brown, it's a brownish gas. It's emitted from high pressure fossil fuel combustion. Um, and sulfur oxides are um, gases that impair your health and can also lead to the production of particulates. They also contribute to acid rain, so they change the way your plants grow um, and they reduce your visibility in the air as well. And finally, particulates matters. Um, particulate matter, there's a lot of different words that go around for this, but essentially these are solid particles um, that are in the air. So some are bigger, some like dust and soot and smoke you can see with your eyes, and some are really small um, on the order of like 2.5 micrometers wide. Um, and these are so small that they can penetrate deep into your lungs and really cause respiratory um, damage deep inside. And so all of these are being permitted in large numbers. Um, and a lot of these can stay in the atmosphere from anywhere for hours to years. Um, for example, for volatile organic compounds, there's a huge range of them that includes chloroform and benzene. And um, some of them are in the air for a couple minutes. Some of them remain for a few hours. And so as we are trying to understand cumulative impacts, we have to not only understand what's being permitted to be emitted, but also how long it's staying there, where it's going and how it's leaving the atmosphere. Um, which I know sounds really scary because that sounds really complex and complicated, um, but that is why we've assembled a coalition of folks um, all around the region who are helping us understand and work on these problems. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Erica Jackson from the Frack Tracker Alliance, um, which is an awesome group that has been helping us map and understand the extent that the industry has grown over the past decade. Um, so I'll hand it off to Erica. Thank you. Um, hey everyone. My name is Erica Jackson. I'm the manager of community outreach and support with Frack Tracker. I'm based in Pittsburgh. Um, if you're not familiar, Frack Tracker Alliance studies and maps uh, the environmental and public health impacts of the oil and gas industry. Um, we have a lot of resources, not just for Ohio, but pretty much anywhere in the country where oil and gas extraction is happening. So you can um, find those at our website, fracktracker.org. Uh, Belmont County is one of one of the counties um, that's been most hit by the fracking industry in Ohio. Um, it sits above the Marcellus and Utica Shale. Um, so there are over 700 permitted horizontal wells. Um, it's kind of like a proxy for fracked wells. Um, and on the left, on this map, um, this GIF, um, um, compilation of maps, you can see the build out of those laterals. So when you're, when you're thinking of a well, it's kind of like an iceberg. What you see above ground is kind of just the tip. Um, there is a lot going on underground. So all of those black lines are the horizontal laterals that extend underground um, to frack open the shale rock. And um, they can be up to three miles long. And we're at Frack Tracker, we've been um, following this and they're um, actually getting longer, the trend is that they're getting longer, which means that they're more resource intensive using more water and sand and um, chemicals to frack open a well. Um, 
So you can see the build out over time and how many wells have been permitted over the years, um, which has actually gone down in recent years. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide, Ben. Thanks. So um, in addition, and to all those wells and the laterals underground, there are also pipelines connecting all of these wells gathering the gas. And along those pipeline routes are compressor stations, um, which is their source of emission. So there are a few compressor stations. You can see the pink triangles on the, on the map on the left. And then there's the, uh, the land that's been purchased by PTT for the ethane cracker in yellow. Um, again, in that map on the left. Um, so, and those are all, um, you know, sources of emissions that are that exist in the county. And then, um, on the map on the right, you can see there is the site that of uh, the potential ethane cracker. Um, but it would require again a build out of more infrastructure, um, in addition to you know requiring more wells, as Leah mentioned. Um, it would also be connected to other facilities. So. And um, that kind of red coral color would be a mountaineer um, natural gas liquid storage site to store natural gas, to store fracked gas for the ethane cracker, a site to um, process the fracked gas for the ethane cracker, which would, is shown in blue, blue racer. And then um, if storage caverns are made to store that fracked gas, then um, this salty brine would be brought to the surface and that would be um, taken to another site to be processed across the And all of those would be needed to um, be needed to be connected by pipeline connected infrastructure. And then if you can click forward one, um, I put some, um, if you can just go to the, yeah, there, thank you. Um, so the emissions for these sites, or you can go back one. Sorry. The emissions for these sites um, vary greatly. So I put some statistics, they're covered up by the map now, but um, if you're able to, thank you. Um, I looked at some reported values in Pennsylvania and averaged them. And so these are VOCs, volatile organic um, compounds. And, and again, they really vary over the lifetime of a well or the lifetime of a compressor and also the specific site. But it's just, um, just to show you that the emissions of an ethane cracker are much more than the emissions of a compressor station, which are generally more than the emissions from a well. So uh, just kind of to show you the relative scale of an ethane cracker is a huge, um, huge pollutant burden and it would really take this region um, back in terms of air quality improvements that have happened over um, the past few years. And compared to the former site here, the, the coal plant, the RE Burger coal plant, um, this would probably have less, uh, is permitted to have less sulfur dioxide than nitrogen oxides. Um, those are associated with burning coal, but it would have much more carbon monoxide and, and VOCs than that. Um, so we've been, I've been working with uh, Concerned Ohio River residents residents to make a map of this, which is the, on the next um, slide. And I'll, I'll also put a link to that in the chat. Um, on that, I've been trying to determine what potential pipeline routes could be. Um, those are shown in pink or the purple are like, you know, possible pipeline routes in the area and the pink are, are routes that could be more direct to connect those facilities. You can also explore all the data um, and click on it to learn more about the status of these wells and permits. And um, if you go one more, there is a QR code. So you can pull that up right now, but I'll also just put the link in the in the chat and I'll put the link to um, another article that Frack Tracker did about this um, PTT site um, in case you're looking to find out more. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. We really appreciate your work mapping all this off, uh, mapping these uh, pipeline routes. Um, next, we would like to introduce Debbie uh, of the Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project. Debbie is a public health expert and will be sharing some health impacts of air pollution in Ohio and Belmont County. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm the medical outreach coordinator with the Environmental Health Project. 
It's a public health nonprofit that focuses on the health impacts of shale gas development and helping those living in communities near this development. Um, and I wanna thank you for having us uh, for this webinar. Um, some of this uh, we've already discussed, but just from a health, strictly health perspective, shale gas presents multiple risks to our health. The shale gas industry introduces toxic materials into the environment, both through the chemicals they routinely use and by bringing up others from within the earth. Some of the chemicals they employ are known toxins and carcinogens. Um, and many of the substances used have not been tested for human toxicity or for low level exposure impacts. Um, also, a lot of chemicals just in general have been tested on um, adult men more so than children or pregnant women. So um, that needs to be taken into account as well. So how does this affect health? Experience has shown that there are many environmental pathways of exposure um, to gas. Direct emissions from infrastructure are of a concern and concentration of pollutants will be greater the closer you are to the source. Um, so uh, showing a need for setbacks. Diesel emissions from truck traffic are also of concern as well pads require a multitude of truck trips. Both fracking fluid and waste, liquid and solid, create additional pathways of exposure. These require transportation via truck or pipeline. Accidents and leaks occur. In order to get rid of, of it conveniently, liquid waste has been turned into products. For example, um, it's been used as dust suppressants on roads um, and landfills accepting fracking waste produce emissions and leachate that are toxic. How and where the leachate is disposed may result in further pathways of exposure. Therefore, exposures may occur far from the original source. And even when we're talking about the liquid waste, you need to worry about um, VOCs and fumes coming off, off that liquid if it's open to the air. Remember again that oil and gas waste is exempted from much of the federal environmental code and therefore is not treated or labeled as the toxic waste that it is. So human health may be affected by inhalation, ingestion or skin contact with shell gas pollution that gets into our air, water and soil. Health impacts are affected by how long the person is exposed, how often that exposure occurs, and how toxic the exposure is. Health impacts are also influenced by the vulnerability of the population. For example, children tend to be much more vulnerable than adults to environmental exposures in that they are growing and developing rapidly, both their brain and their body. They accumulate more toxins in their bodies than adults as they don't clear toxins from their bodies efficiently and they spend more time engaged in vigorous activity outside, breathing the air, putting their hands in their mouths. So a um, lot more activity there. Um, in addition, exposures may cause health effects in the short term that may seem minor, but short-term health effects should not be ignored as there are warnings of exposure. Long-term health impacts much be, may be much more serious. These impacts include such as asthma, heart and lung disease, adverse effects on developing fetuses, neurological issues, and cancer. So at EHP, we uh, did a study that looked at 88 residents who lived within one kilometer or about half a mile of wells or compressor stations. We looked at symptoms in terms of body systems. So for instance, we think of headache, dizziness, and memory problems as all being part of the neurologic system. We also indicated how many people reported each symptom. We know that some of these are common health complaints in any population, but we're interested in the fact that not all are particularly common and that residents themselves attribute many of their symptoms to the well pads or compressor stations nearby. We're also seeing similar patterns of symptoms reported by other researchers and community groups. And many of these symptoms also align with acute symptoms associated with exposure to some of the chemicals that we know are in fact being used. The body of literature on health impacts is growing as well. This table represents epidemiological studies that have found statistically significant associations between exposure to shell gas development and adverse health outcomes. Epidemiological studies are conducted by observing human populations to evaluate whether there is a relationship between an exposure and a health impact and are vitally important to better understanding the effects of environmental exposures. Thank you, Debbie. 
Next, we'd like to introduce Lissa, a scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, who is studying air monitoring. Good evening, Lissa. Hi, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm really grateful that you're all spending your evening here listening to us. This is really um, exciting for all of us who've been working on this all together. Um, ben, if you wanna go to the next slide, that would be great. Awesome. Um, so I think that the best way to transition is to think about, um, everyone's done such a great job of setting the scene of the, the health impacts um, and Leah brought up the fact that um, we want to understand how much of this pollution is occurring in the area. And so I wanted to introduce a little bit about how um, we might be able to better understand um, the concentration of different pollutants and what's being emitted uh, in Valmont County. So generally there's kind of three main ways that the EPA or scientists would be able to understand the air quality. Uh, the first would be from satellites. Um, so Leah had talked about satellite data being used to show um, that big emissions of, of methane just a little bit ago. Um, and then we also use monitors and modeling. And so you can see here on this screen, there's three uh, yellow dots. And so each of those is a monitor in, in the area. Um, and so, uh, each, each type of data collection has its own purpose. Uh, sometimes it's to get data at a specific place on a map or a specific point in time, or to understand where emissions are coming from um, or where emissions might go. Uh, and so in the case of Belmont, there's two main ways that data is being used by the EPA and two main, main ways that we're trying to also provide a little bit more publicly available and community co contributed data as well. Um, and that's through monitors and models. Uh, so the mo monitors that are currently in the region that are hosted by the EPA are shown in these yellow dots here. And so one of those is in Ohio and the other two are in West Virginia. And each of those actually collects different types of data. And so the top one you can see, um, that one measures particulate matter and ozone. Uh, the middle one measures uh, nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. And the lower one um, measures particulate matter and SO2. So none of these are measuring directly VOCs. Um, ozone is a product of VOCs. So in some ways it's getting that, but it's not directly measuring VOCs. So that is one thing that we've been kind of thinking about and trying to figure out better ways to understand the OCs in the region. Um, the second thing is that we get a good understanding maybe of uh, the pollution at these specific points, but where monitors like this might fail is telling us what's going on in the entire region. And so that's really hard um, to get a good understanding from just three points what's happening in one region. And that's why new permits for large emitters require actually modeling work in order to understand the impact that these emissions will have across the region. And so that's what the EPA tends to do when they're permitting. Um, and we've looked into kind of the modeling as well that's been going on. Um, but generally you also have to realize that modeling doesn't represent reality perfectly. Uh, so oftentimes um, modeling that we do is just another tool in the toolbox essentially. So it has to make oftentimes assumptions about the weather, um, assumptions about the amount of emissions, what chemistry you're going to take into account. And they're often simplifying things much more than they would be in real life because it's just so complicated. And so a lot of times models might have to assume averages or even out a lot of spikes in weather da data um, or in um, emissions data. And so that leaves us with a gap. We, we have monitors with really good data, but a few sites and we have models that show across the region, but not a lot to compare them to. Um, and so that's where what we'll be talking about for a little bit beyond here um, with a number of other speakers is thinking about networks of low cost sensors. Um, those are super useful. Uh, so low cost sensors aren't necessarily always as accurate um, as something like these really expensive EPA sensors, 
But what they do allow us to do is capture better, a better widespread picture of air quality and uh, try to calibrate that to more expensive air quality sensors. So later, Anna is going to talk about the network that um, the that core is trying to set up across Belmont in order to do just this, which is capture a better picture of what air quality in Belmont looks like. But first, I want to walk through a small example of why this might be important to kind of combine and work together. So if we think about this like a painting, essentially, is my, my favorite way to think about this. Um, if you start out with just knowing three dots, I think one of mine isn't showing, so we'll say two dots. Um, on a painting and you know what color they are. And that's kind of like having a few monitors in that area. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, just click, awesome, thanks. Um, and we try to take those colors and we expand those and we're like, oh, let's get an estimate of what the painting looks like based off of these colors, off of these three dots. That doesn't really give us a great picture of what the painting would actually look like. Um, we just spread those out. So now, we move on and think maybe about a model. Um, and we think of ourselves as getting an outline and maybe the color palette of the painting. And we're getting a better understanding of the image we're going for. We still may have missed some of the details. Uh, we'd smooth some things out and we may not have um, exactly the picture that we're going for, but we're getting better. Now, the next slide, um, if we take a lot of monitors, where we're getting what the data looks like in that area and we combine it with that previous image and think about that as a model, then what we can get is um, the next slide, um, an even more realistic understanding or painting. We will never be 100% perfect at understanding this, but combining that modeling and, and the monitor data allows us to understand and compare between the two. So we get the model and we can compare and understand where maybe there are some errors and adjust things. And so um, I think that's one of the take home messages about why it's really important to have a really um, robust network to understand what types of pollution is in the area. Thanks so much for this illustration, Lissa. Um, next, we'd like to introduce Anna of Carnegie Mellon University's Create Lab who will be talking about citizen monitoring networks. Thanks, Ben and Lissa and team. Um, so Concerned Ohio River Residents and Freshwater Accountability Project are groups made up of volunteer community members who spend their time digesting all of this information and then contributing their experiences to the conversations that would otherwise only include regulators and industry. These experiences are critical to understanding the effectiveness of pollution controls and government air quality monitoring efforts like the ones Lissa were, was just demonstrating. So citizen owned, citizen owned monitoring networks are a strong support system for translating these on the ground experiences into the data language that can contribute to conversations about enforcement. CORE and FWAP members started their citizen monitoring networks with an air quality monitor called Purple Air. These relatively low cost monitors measure PM 2.5, which is the same particle pollutant unit that is measured by all three of the EPA monitors that Lissa was referring to in the Belmont County area. PM 2.5 is a generalized dust particle measurement that does not always trend well with chemical or volatile organic compound VOC pollution, but will almost always spike when black visible smoke or smog pollution is present. In an effort to complement the EPA monitoring system that measures this common pollutant in Belmont County, CORE and FWAP assisted more than 10 households to host a purple air monitor, all with publicly available data that is ready for viewing right now. Purple air monitors are widely used across the country and are even recognized by the EPA on their site, fire.airnow.gov. In the EPA's own words, while these sensors don't meet the rigorous standards required for regulatory monitors, they can help you get a picture of air quality nearest to you. So to be clear, these monitors data do not hold up in a court of law 
and cannot produce enforcement orders on industrial pollution. But the fact that the EPA recognizes their value in this way is a good indicator of the common sense direction our government agencies should take in to use every available resource to understand complicated airsheds like we have in Appalachia. River valleys like ours have a long history of industrial institutions that neighbor residential areas with high populations. And the topography of a river valley is uniquely susceptible to holding and acting as a corridor for pollution. Knowing that PM 2.5 was not the only pollutant that is emitted from petrochemical and fracking industrial activity in Belmont County, CORE and FWAP added VOC monitors to their citizen monitoring network. This data is also publicly available on voc.createlab.org. So feel free to scan your camera over that QR code to follow along with these couple examples of VOC pollution that we will highlight next. The spikes we saw emanating from the Powhatan monitor seemed to indicate a nearby source. As you can see on October 17th between 4 and 6 a.m., the Powhatan VOC monitor experiences highly elevated VOC readings. Then by 7 a.m. they have reached the Moundsville VOC monitor and that monitor's readings spike until 9 a.m. and the pollutants seem to have slightly dispersed and that is demonstrated by the line chart below or beside the map depending on if you are viewing this data on your phone or computer. Then from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. the pollution hits the Shadyside monitor following the river valley upriver through all those communities and potentially lifting with the change in temperature around that time of day. You know, these are just ideas of how this has worked. And um, we see that there's a slightly higher regional VOC picture as all the monitors turn slightly more red. Similar examples of the relationship between monitors within the network can be noted on October 19th, 20th and 21st, and I'm sure there will be more. There is a general trend of regional relationship between monitors, meaning as the monitors change color, they generally do together. More monitors would further emphasize this point. If weather patterns are tracked next to air quality monitor network trends, an argument could be made for enforcement to tighten on days when the weather conditions could exacerbate a heavily polluted region and even bring it out of compliance during those events. Unfortunately, the method of averaging data from regulatory monitors decreases the impact of these spikes when determining pollution enforcement. The citizen team who strategically placed these monitors knows all too well what this data clearly points to as the source of this hazardous pollution. The compressor station at Powhatan Point frequently emits, and as the Citizen Monitoring Network demonstrated, pollution potentially follows big run down to the Ohio River. The experience of people living nearby is corroborated by a comprehensive expanded air quality monitoring network. Ben, would you mind advancing the slide? Thanks. In this way, low cost monitor, um, air quality monitoring networks provide valuable information about regional patterns and they have the potential to indicate unmonitored zones for regulators. These images were collected by Ted Ock, uh, PhD, the Great Lakes Program Coordinator with the Frack Tracker Alliance using drone technology. Pollution sources like these have the power to impact their neighbors as well as the whole regional airshed and low cost monitoring networks are a way for citizens to know for themselves how the data may corroborate their experiences of pollution and give people a language with which to advocate for more regulatory monitors that have the power to hold industry accountable. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next, we're bringing in Dr. Yuri Gorby to talk a little more about the citizen monitoring uh, process. Hello, everyone. Let me get my things set up. Yes, hi everyone. One second. Okay. 
Um, yes, we have uh, to date installed a number of uh, purple air monitors and as Anna just pointed out, we have also coupled those with the uh, VOC monitors and which also have a uh, PM 2.5 capacity to them. Uh, the second monitor is produced by AirViz and the first by um, Purple Air. We place these monitors strategically based upon topography, uh, prevailing wind patterns, and the location of um, potential emission sites throughout the valley. And I want to state that these monitors are actually, <clears throat> if anyone's interested in them, in having them installed near their home or at their home, uh, they are very uh, low profile monitors. They can be put outside. The only requirements we have is an outside power, power source and access to uh, Wi-Fi so that the data can be continuously uploaded to a publicly available database. Um, again, we are prioritizing the locations of these monitors uh, currently based upon, again, the location of uh, related infrastructure, uh, gas wells, uh, compressor stations, and other complexes. And we'd like to, uh, to state that anyone that is interested uh, and concerned about the air quality in their region can contact us uh, and um, request uh, access to one of these monitors or installation of one of these monitors. We're also working um, with a mobile unit that we can actually drive around to a hotspot. So if we do have an uh, indication mm -hmm. that one emission site is, um, is emitting heavily, that we could travel to a suspected drainage site as we saw in the previous uh, slide, uh, down Big Run, um, just south of that uh, Powhatan Point area, and those types of drainages that lead these heavier than air, air compounds down into uh, lower regions and especially populated regions, uh, those would be areas that we would have a, a mobile unit that we could go out and track the, these uh, plumes. I think that that's uh, it for now for my uh, portion of the presentation. Thanks so much, Yuri. And again, um, if you're interested in uh, uh, receiving one of these air monitoring uh, equipment, uh, please scan the QR code or check the chat later for a link to our air monitoring distribution survey. Um, the next part of our presentation is about taking personal action. What can you do to stop the effects of air pollution uh, from, from harming your health? Um, we're going to talk about what you can do on a personal level to protect your health. Knowing when to act, keeping a health diary, keeping open conversation with your healthcare provider. Um, and also we want you to be aware of the your own capacity to monitor regional air quality through our citizen monitoring network. Um, you can also report these incidents to the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. On a community level, we'll talk later about how to get involved with CORE. Um, and remember, if you see something, you should say something. We want to remind you to keep open, com open communication with your neighbors about air pollution um, to keep yourself and your community safe. Uh, next, I'd like to reintroduce Debbie, who is going to continue uh, with what you can do to protect yourself, the case for a health impact assessment. Thank you, uh, Ben. Um, so, and to protect yourself, the first thing you need to do is, um, and this is to protect you and your family, you have to first be aware of being having exposures. All right, so be aware of shell gas or petrochemical development in your area. And this may be, there's a lot of different equipment. So it may be um, well pads, compressor stations, pig launchers, et cetera. Um, and actually EHP does have a document that goes through the illustrated stages um, on our website. You wanna know how close that infrastructure is to where you live, work and play um, and where related traffic is traveling. Uh, the FRAC Tracker website, um, as mentioned before, is a good resource um, to see where infrastructure is, um, as is just driving around um, in the region around where you live and looking for that infrastructure. You wanna keep your home clean uh, using a damp cloth or a vacuum with a HEPA filter. You wanna prevent dust from becoming airborne within your home. 
Uh, you want to be careful not to track pollution from the outside into the inside because if that pollution's in your air, it's settling on the ground and you're picking that up with your um, shoes or your pet's paws. So you want to wipe your feet and your pet's paws before you come inside. Um, and especially if you have little ones and they're crawling around on the floor, you want to make sure that that pollution is not ending up on the floor. If you have well water, you want to get a baseline test done and then you want to test your water frequently. Um, and you also want to notice any visual or smell changes to your water and you might want to consider monitoring your water for total dissolved solids. Um, which if there's a change in that it's a good indicator that your well water is being impacted. Um, and once again, more information can be found on environmentalhealthproject.org's website. Um, this is important for your internal air as well, because anywhere you use the water in your house, if it is impacted by shale gas development, it's going to contain VOCs. And those VOCs are dissolved in the water, but will re be released when it runs through your faucet and um, be in the room with you. So anywhere you're using the water within your house, you will want to vent to the outside. Um, also very important is paying attention to the weather as weather can determine if pollution near your home is settling and concentrating or rising and moving away. And based on the conditions, you'll know when to close the windows and filter or purify your indoor air versus when uh, the air is rising away from your home, then you can uh, open your windows up and your air your home out. If you recognize you're being exposed, you can take steps to reduce that exposure. This may reduce your risk of chronic or long-term health impacts. It's also very, very important to talk to your healthcare provider about your concerns, keeping in mind that many healthcare providers do not often have a lot of background in environmental exposure. So be prepared um, at the beginning of your appointment with a list of your concerns. Let your healthcare provider know how close you are to shale gas infrastructure, or petrochemical infrastructure, and whether you live in a valley or low-lying area, as air pollution um, or air and air pollution tend to settle and concentrate in lower areas, as it was just discussed. Um, most importantly, keep a daily health diary to document health and environmental changes to back up your concerns. And um, you already saw one example of a health daily health diary that uh, Leah showed you. Um, they can be very, very simple. You want to list your symptoms. You want to include how intense you thought it was and how long those symptoms lasted. Emissions from shale gas infrastructure tend to be episodic or released in spurts and episodes, not at a constant rate. So your symptoms may also be episodic and come and go. So just keep that in mind. Um, how long did the symptom last and what time of the day did it occur? Anything you notice in the environment may be of importance especially to your healthcare provider. So noises, odor, any new industrial activity, weather conditions and wind direction, because depending on which way the wind's blowing, you may be getting um, more or less of that type of um, exposure. Discuss this all with your doctor, recognizing short-term symptoms of exposure and working to reduce exposures, once again, helps to prevent long-term chronic health consequences. All right, so what can we do as a community? One of the things um, we can do as a community to protect our health is to advocate for a health impact assessment. Um, you and your community could take a health impact assessment, um, which helps you to um, create a database of information basically that answers a lot of questions about what health impacts um, shell gas or petrochemical infrastructure um, may have on your community. So just to give a good definition of that, a health impact assessment gives you a structured way to bring together data on your community, the expected emissions from shell gas or petrochemical development and the potential risks posed to residents in the immediate area. It also provides decision makers with a comprehensive perspective on siting or maintaining of the proposed infrastructure and on how that will affect the surrounding community. Um, so 
EHP has created um, HIAs for well pads, uh, compressor stations, and um, petrochemical complexes. The central question of the HIA is, do you have enough information to determine whether it's safe to have this infrastructure in your community? And the HIA equips the community with the critical questions to answer that question. In addition, it gives the framework to accumulate that information so that it can be brought to the attention of the public leaders in your community. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? By understanding the risks, you can better advocate for actions that protect health. So, for example, what's going to be on the site? Who will be near the site? What are the emissions? Are there vulnerable populations near the site, like schools? These are things that this will help you to make sure you're getting those questions in, what chemicals are being used, et cetera. So definitely something to um, consider doing as a community. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so to our allies from the outside, those who are attending our presentation tonight who do not live in Belmont County or the surrounding areas, um, here are some actions that you can take to help us out. If you're interested in organizing, contact us at Concerned Ohio River, oh, Concerned Ohio River residents, excuse me, on Twitter or Facebook and share our posts. We try to amplify the information we share with residents of Belmont County to get the word out. Join our group in Halt the Harm campaign network. Um, reach out to Ryan, whose uh, contact information we'll provide later um, to get involved in Halt the Harm. Um, if you have skills to offer, join the Halt the Harm resource directory. You could also consider donating to Concerned Ohio River residents on our GoFundMe page. Uh, to help our communications efforts and get the word out about petrochemical development in the Ohio River Valley. And you could also sign our petitions. Uh, we have one uh, advocating for no more plastic factories for Ohio, and a second one advocating for what Debbie just talked about. Uh, we want to revoke all current permits and deny, and deny future permits associated with petrochemical development facilities until a health impact study is completed. Lastly, lead a community science project in your community with the Thriving Earth Exchange. More information on that will be provided later. And to those attending our presentation who do live in Belmont County, we want to again summarize what you can do to protect yourself. On a personal level, be aware of your proximity to shale gas activity. Keep an eye on the weather and know when to stay indoors. Keeping a health diary will allow you, will ease communication with your healthcare provider if you do end up experiencing any symptoms related to uh, fracking related air pollution. And also uh, look into attaining an air purifier to make sure your air is filtered, your, to filter out contaminants. Um, next, uh, monitor your regional air quality through our citizen monitoring network. The more you know about pollution levels in your area, the better equipped you'll be to keep yourself safe. And again, report incidents to the Ohio Envi Environmental Protection Agency. On a community level, organize with concerned Ohio River residents. Talk to your neighbors about any health impacts you may be having related to fracking-related air pollution um, and organize your community to make a difference. And lastly, again, consider signing our petition to demand Ohio's uh, regulatory agencies freeze any new permits to petrochemical-related facilities until a comprehensive health impact study is completed. Uh, lastly, we'd like to thank our contributors. Um, Bev Reed of Concerned Ohio River Residents, Jill Hunkler, also of Concerned Ohio River Residents, Dr. Yuri Gorby of the Freshwater Accountability Project, Barb Mew, citizens participating in the monitoring program, Dr. Ted Ock of Frack Tracker Alliance, Thriving Earth Exchange, Earthworks, Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, and our funders. If you'd like uh, more information about anything we've talked about today, feel free to reach out to any of us. Our contact information is listed on the right-hand side of the slide. And again, we'll be providing this slideshow to everyone who registered for this event via email. Uh, and next, uh, I'd like to reintroduce Ryan, who's going to facilitate our Q&A. All right, hey, everybody. Um, so glad, to, thank you so much for, for hosting, Ben. And thanks everyone who presented. Um, it was fantastic to, um, and hold on just a moment, let me uh, get everything up on my screen correctly. Get the view going here so I can see everyone. Awesome. 
Okay, so um, great. So I'm Ryan, I'm with Health to Harm Network. And just for anyone who is unfamiliar with the network, we provide tools to connect you to other people in the movement. So one of those tools is called the Campaign Network and it's fairly new. We're learning every day ways to improve the network, uh, but essentially it's like a private social network for people working on these issues. We're building a knowledge base so that you can search and find articles and conversations and connect with people near you. And Concerned Ohio River Residents is one of the new groups on the platform um, just getting started and you can actually join to and say hi in that space. So I'll put a link in the chat in just a moment to that. Uh, but I am going to be facilitating the Q&A. And so what you can do is put a question in the chat and I'll read it off to presenters. And presenters, um, if there's something that you wanna speak to, please jump in and I'll go through all the questions. So I'm actually gonna go back and look at some of the previous questions that came in, but please um, add any questions that you have about the presentation. So the um, first question that I have here from Ken, um, who said, I've heard Carnegie Mellon University was working on a VOC monitor that can be used by community members close to fracking well. Can anyone speak to that? I'm happy to take that question, but I also um, would, would point you to um, a community leader near you that partners with the CREATE Lab at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I've facilitated relationships with um, community groups throughout the tri-state area, West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania to distribute um, uh, monitors that um, community groups find funding to buy from a for-profit company called Airviz. And then um, we believe in sustained relationships that um, offer uh, our expertise in data visualization to go through data periodically and, um, and help to tell stories that community groups find impactful. So I, I would, I would, if you are in Belmont County, I would contact Yuri Gorby um, about a monitor, or um, there's also a link to the um, intake survey that um, Ben Hunkler put together. Mm -hmm. And are, are, are we able to send all these links out in the uh, email with the replay as well? Yeah, I, I believe so. So, yep. um, and uh, yes, uh, so Helen says, can we get a link to the slides? And yes, um, it's my understanding that the slides will also be provided along with the replay. So um, along with those the QR codes that are directly in the slide that lets you uh, scan and find a link, um, we'll put those links into that email as well. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Um, so thank you, Ken. And Scott says the, o, uh, the Ohio EPA offers water quality certification courses to those who can provide good data upon completion. Could similarly uh, air quality certifications also be earned through the EPA to help gather accurate data? So would, would anyone like to take that question? Is there a, a way that that um, could be translated to air quality? I'm happy to hop in, but if someone else also wants to talk, you're welcome to join in on that. Um, I, I haven't heard of that happening in the air quality space, um, but I, all I can say in response to that is that's a really cool idea. Um, <laughs> and I think that's like a, a really interesting point. And I think Anna just unmuted herself to maybe contribute. So please go ahead. 
Sorry, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't know of anything directly in the Belmont County area, but um, I'm sure that in the world of coronavirus, where most things are online, there might be a way to access the Group Against Smog and Pollution's smoke reading um, program. So uh, GASP, G-A-S-P, um, Group Against Smog and Pollution, based out of Pittsburgh, offers um, a chance to participate in a training where you're able to learn about the opacity of visible smoke. And it's the same certification process that somebody on um, uh, the on the ground hired by industry has to go through to be able to assess opacity and determine if there's um, any breaches of the permit of any particular industry. Um, I believe Marin Cook is on the call. She could talk about this, I'm sure. Um, she's with Group Against Smog and Pollution. So I, I would encourage people to look that up. Awesome, thank you. Let me know if you want more elaboration. Um, so one of the other questions that came in is from Charles. Uh, what's your biggest obstacle to getting the attention of different EPA agencies to take action? Uh, I'll, I'll take a, I'll give you some personal examples if you would like. Um, yeah, this is, there are numerous obstacles. First of all, I'm waiting on a public records request from the Ohio EPA to find out how many inspectors there are because when we call, because there's an incident like a blowdown and people are actually, uh, you know, having breathing problems and they have to stay indoors and they're having fatigues and headache. And we, we want to know exactly what they're being exposed to. <laughs> We're unable to get the uh, Ohio EPA to show up in time to be able to do the air monitoring with the proper equipment to find out what is actually causing that exposure at real time. So, you know, it's kind of really unfortunate that we have to do this ourselves. I don't think that we should have to, but I was in resistance to that for years. And then I realized what we are doing is so much better than what we've been able to achieve going through the agencies. It's not that they're not, uh, uh, you know, within the agency that they don't want to help us, but there are the constraints of resources. But there's also, you know, I, I I've been told very little field monitoring equipment that's available that, you know, so it was surprising to me to know that I will get hold of the state highway patrol sometimes when I call in for people, because, you know, it is important to document and to call in to the uh, Ohio EPA emergency response and let them know when something's happening and to document it yourself and to follow up, especially when you're living nearby. Uh, but then, you might get the uh, local police to show up. You might get the local fire department and they don't have the air monitoring equipment nor the training to be able to tell you what you're being exposed to. So this is the impetus for what we decided to do. And I'd also like to invite maybe uh, Jill Hunkler, if she could just say a few words because I know we're very motivated to do this community science now after our experience and uh, we're already seeing the results of some of the monitors that have been deployed and Jill's hands on with getting these deployed herself because, well, just tell a little bit about your story, Jill, about you know living in, in the region, in Belmont County. Hi everyone, I'm grateful to have a chance to share some of what I've experienced here and basically an occupied territory by the oil and gas industry. Um, but I'll kind of answer the question first about one of the biggest challenges we faced when trying to get help and report incidents of concern to the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. Um, what I have learned is that the, when, when I, an incident when I called the Ohio EPA after uh, residents in a several mile radius around Barnes were smelling strong hydrocarbon odors for extended period of time, People had headaches, even my family, friends, nausea, um, called the EPA and he said he would look into it and call me back. He said he contacted the Ohio um, Emergency Management, I mean, sorry, the Belmont County Emergency Management Director who um, then contacted the industry uh, in the area to find out what was going on. And there, there was a safety valve uh, leak on a pipeline. Um, 
I was then told that the industry is the only one with the specialized monitoring equipment to investigate any incidents of concern in the area. Um, the Ohio EPA doesn't have the equipment, uh, only the industry and the federal EPA, uh, which is never present, rarely present here in Belmont County. So I think it's very important for people to understand that the regulatory agencies are relying upon the industry to do uh, any investigation into incidents of concern. Um, also personally, after uh, building my home in the country, deciding to, you know, to settle in there. Um, eventually, thanks to Ted Alpha Frack Tracker, he mapped my home for actually a Columbus dispatch story about air pollution in the area. And I was surrounded by 78 wells and a compressor station that I had to file an intent to sue to try to get um, uh, our complaints heard about health impacts from this compressor station. And it uh, was found to be in significant and ongoing violations of the Clean Air Act and Health Pollution Control Act. Um, and it took basically uh, an attorney getting the Ohio um, General's Office involved to get any remediation done at that facility and it took years. Um, so anyway, those are just some incidents when we, uh, even with many people having health impacts and complaining, it took a flare image from Earthworks uh, after a year of complaining to finally get the Ohio EPA to investigate the situation. So that's just one incident. Uh, and I've unfortunately had to move from my home due to uh, pollutants um, from the well pads and the compressor stations and the pipelines surrounding my home. So I consider myself a fracking refugee. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to move out to the country for the fresh air. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, so um, let me see if anybody else has any questions. We're getting getting down to the bottom here. So please add them in the chat. Uh, we have a question from John who asks, uh, can you provide an example of a community where a community health assessment has been done? I put a link in the chat to a book about it as specifically relates to fracking. So we do have the protocol to be able to do that. We certainly have the substantiation to do that. But um, Debbie, do you know if it's been done in the shale fields, Colorado, anywhere? It needs to be done. Right. Um I do know recently that they did use a health impact assessment when they were looking at um, the Edgar Thompson site in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, I know we worked with them on that. Um, and I think that had uh, a lot of influence. I know recently, um, at least they have um, not re-permitted uh, because the permit had run out. Um, and I don't know where that'll go from here, but right now um, the community hasn't uh, renewed the permit for that. Um, that's the one I'm familiar with. I have not worked that much with the HIA with, um, I know we have worked with other people, but that hasn't been my area of focus. So I don't have an example to give you on that, other than the Edgar Thompson site. And that was a um, going in, you know, I mean, it's not there yet. It, it's basically to, to look at what would be the impact if, if it were there, so. I just added a link into the chat for everyone. Um, it's a webinar about the health impact assessments. Um, so it what's cool about it is it goes through the process of how to do the impact assessments and then provides the templates, um, you know, the questionnaires that can be used to help gather the, the data. So that, that might be a good resource for that, that as well. Right, and, um, and I can find more information on that as well and, and uh, get that to the person um, that has the question. Cool, yeah, so John, uh, reach out to, to Debbie. <laughs> and you got the, the contact right here on the, on the screen. It's yeah. super helpful slide. Thanks for sharing that. 
Um, so Laura just came in with a question. Do you have recommendations for townships to develop ordinances on air control for areas that compressor stations, et cetera, are coming, coming into the area? Any recommendations for townships developing ordinances? I would say set up a citizen monitoring network before the polluter comes in so that you can try to establish a baseline understanding of where your air quality is before the pollution starts, if possible. I want to follow up on that, Anna. Um, what would be like sufficient data to have a baseline? That's such a good question. It's really hard to answer, but I mean, in an ideal world, it like the baseline time period would cover seasons, um, uh, changes in weather patterns in general. So enough data that you could, without a doubt, have a clear baseline. Yeah, and indicate like how um, much, yeah, how much air quality has shifted. And does that mean, does that usually require uh, somebody or an organization to really take responsibility for like archiving or sort of keeping that data, you know, backed up or <laughs> saved in a, in, in a centralized location? Or like, is there anywhere that you can point people to for best practices for how to do that? Um, Purple Air, um, the, the PM monitor that we talked about tonight has um, access to their historical data um, that they store all publicly available, which is really useful. And mm. um, there's also a resource that the Create Lab manages called the Environmental Sensing Data Repository that um, keeps track of data from thousands of monitors um, over years and years of time. So you might even have a network of monitors around you that has been establishing a baseline um, that you maybe aren't even aware of. And mm -hmm. um, I encourage anybody to reach out to me if they want access or a deep dive look at the environmental sensing data repository. Mm. Awesome. And, and once again, um, here would be another good case for an HIA so that you have an idea of, of what the impact's gonna be health-wise. Um, and then you need to look at things like uh, what you would want to, and I mean, this all falls back on state law too. And um, I know that a little better in Pennsylvania than Ohio. Um, but then just the idea of setbacks and aggregation and all the things that Leah, you talked about earlier in the talk um, mm -hmm. need to sort of be in the mix. Mm hmm And the HIA just makes it so organized to like have that. Well, it gives you it gives point. you something to argue about as well, yeah. right? Um, it gives you a reason for why these things need to be done. Um, mm -hmm. It it helps you to accumulate the data that that will, um, in addition to monitoring, which is invaluable, um, but uh, talks about then you know you know what's going to be permitted what. A lot of these um, chemicals, we have a general idea, not all of them, mind you, but uh, mm -hmm. what health impacts are going to be. And um, there's enough studies out there now, too, um, with, say, compressor stations that, that you know what's basically coming off of them and how it comes off of them. And then you just have to argue that. Um, it's, it's very difficult, I think. Um, for uh, communities because there's a lot of, it's, it's a very powerful industry and it has a lot of backing from, from um, governments and um, it, it makes it uh, more difficult to take on, let's say. But I think that, that just making, bringing these points up and keep hitting on them and pushing for the health um, protective status that, that uh, and just letting people know. I mean, oftentimes these things come in and, and it's so easy just to accept what industry is telling you and you can't see the pollution. So why should you assume that it's dangerous, right? Um, 
So just accumulating that data and having it in a printout and saying, here, this is why we need to look at this from a health perspective. And I would encourage communities to contact uh, the American Geophysical Union Thriving Earth Exchange to be able to get some assistance from science because you can't, well, maybe some people can, you, you know, we the facts are uh, there. What we're seeing already for the monitors and we have more air vis coming uh, is we can track some of the sources of the pollutants and that could have a dampening effect on industry rollout into an area if they know that you're organized and you aim to hold them accountable. So hopefully that could avoid some health impacts. Maybe they wouldn't come at all. We're certainly going to set it up so if the ethane cracker plant gets built at Dilly's Bottom, we'll be able to pin the um, releases on the source. That's, that's the aim of this project. Plus, I think the more, the more community interaction there is, the better chance that they will be forced to take more stringent mm -hmm. precautions. Um, and just just to even watching like local residents near well pads and whatnot, the squeaky well gets the grease. Um, and it's a long, hard slog, but you need to stay on top of it. And this at least lets you know what you're staying on top of. Great. And um... Theodora says, uh, please add the link to the American Geophysical Union and what branch of it you're talking about. So yeah, great. Hey, so um, there's time for, for one more question if somebody wants to pop one in the chat. And um, we're just about at our ending point. So it's perfect timing and um, so we'll see, any other questions or comments, pop them in. I wanna give a, a link also. All right, thank you, Garima, for that link. I'm gonna send a link here again for the campaign network. Actually, a couple of people just joined while we were here on the call, which is always really fun. And if you have a um, account already, then click on the groups area and you'll find the Concerned Ohio River Residents group in the list and you can actually join their group as well. And so one of the things that's really exciting about the campaign network um, as we continue to develop it is that we just opened up an online courses section. So not only are we able to like share the webinars and stuff like that, but some leaders in the network are even starting to think now about trainings that they can provide and use the campaign network as a place to offer those trainings. So people can go through and actually sign up for a course and you know, get experience or offer a training on a particular topic. So the first course that we have available is just a simple checklist for how to set up a group in the network and add your welcome content, invite your first members. Uh, what we're seeing when we look at really successful online groups is that they can be small or they can be really large and they can function for different reasons. So even if it's just uh, the sort of 10 or 15 people that come to your regular meetings, that you can have a internal forum with all of your meeting links and event calendar internal to the group, as well as documents and things that you want to share. Uh, or you can have a public group that anybody can join and you can have events and announcements and gather information into that space. So if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about the campaign network, that's something I'm really excited about and you can find me in there as well and, uh, and we can check in about it. Great, and Karima just put contact info in the chat as well. So. Um, if you're looking to to connect with the Geophysical Union, it's all right there. Uh, would any 
anybody like to make any final comments uh, as we wrap up this evening? I would. Um, I would just like to add that if I could have had access to these monitors in a program monitoring, this a monitoring program like this, while I was dealing with the pollution uh, surrounding my home, particularly the compressor station and dealing with the Ohio EPA, I feel like it not only would have um, brought clarity and taken away the doubt that uh, you know my air was being poisoned, I would have left and uh, not subjected myself to the pollution for so long. But also I feel like instead of taking years to get remediation uh, by the Ohio EPA and, and uh, Mark West, it could have taken only months and, and elim eliminated the suffering potentially of people in that area. So I am very grateful to participate and so happy to be able to offer um, these monitors and be a part of this program to serve uh, the community. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Jill. Yeah, and, and Jill, you're getting some, some thanks in the chat as well. All right. Well, folks, it's eight o'clock. Thank you so much for coming. And we will be sending out all the information and the replay via email. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, thank you to our panelists and 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 presenters this evening and we'll stay connected talk to you later